This is an RNZ podcast. Hello, I'm Simon Morris. The dispute between the big studios and striking writers and actors has been hobbling the movie industry for months now. There's a growing fear that soon we're going to run out of new material. Well, I'm sure the issues are many and complex, but what it seems to boil down to is the writers and actors would like to be paid a bit more, while the studios would prefer to pay as little as possible. To the extent of bypassing the problematic human element entirely and turning to machines. All right, listen. The Terminator's an infiltration unit. Part man, part machine. Underneath, it's a hyper-alloy combat chassis. Microprocessor controlled, fully armoured, very tough. But outside, it's living human tissue. Artificial intelligence is threatening to take our jobs, protests the creative sector, particularly writers. It seems AI will soon be capable of coming up with something that at least looks like a script. And the fear is that for the Philistines running the studios, something that looks like a script may be all they're looking for these days. Yours? Romeo and Ethel, the pirate's daughter. <sighs> yes, I know, I know. What is the story? Well, there's this pirate. Well, the one time that scriptwriters can't really get on their high horses about quality and creative talent is the school holidays. I assume that the film's out this week with a work of human intelligence rather than the artificial variety, but it's a pretty fine distinction at times. The women in our family have the mighty power to turn into giant kraken. What now? Ruby, you're a princess. <laughs> Address the crowd. I think... Believe it or not, Ruby Gilman Teenage Kraken is an actual movie in which two popular elements were welded together by DreamWorks Animation, whether it made any sense or not. High school comedy meets sea monsters with a bit of Disney princess thrown in for good measure. You are the protector of all the ocean's creatures. It's up to you to stop the evil mermaids. <laughs> but... People love mermaids. Of course they do. People are stupid. Jane Fonda, of all people, was roped in to try and sell this nonsense, despite the fact it probably should never have left the drawing board. Over the way, another mashup for an even younger demographic. What do modern audiences love most, computer? That's right, superheroes and adorable puppies. When our world is threatened, one team is ready to launch. <gasps> Did he say lunch? Uh, no. I said launch. Uh, the meteor's heading straight for us! <gasps> ah, mashups. What will we do without you? It's the second Paw Patrol movie in which a bunch of puppies gain super canine powers and then... Well, I'm not sure what happens then since I couldn't quite bring myself to go and see it. I think we've got superpowers. <laughs> I believe Kim Kardashian is a guest voice in Paw Patrol, the Mighty Movie, which may or may not be a selling point. Speaking of superheroes... It's called the Scarab. It's some kind of world-destroying weapon. It's designed to protect its host. Sometimes it does what you want and sometimes it doesn't. I, I, I think I cut a bus in half. Once again, it's as if Chat GPT was asked to invent a superhero movie. Blue Beetle is a little bit of Spider-Man, bits of Shazam and the Green Lantern, all the right elements, so why isn't it working? Well, it seems artificial intelligence can only go so far before you have to apply the real thing. Anyway, he has an accident. An accident? Yeah, and he becomes clairvoyant, like a oh, psychic. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, so it's kind of a psychic political thriller comedy with a heart. With a heart. And uh, not unlike Ghost meets Manchurian Candidate. Go on, go on, I'm listening. Mashups of settings that worked before have been the basis of Hollywood since long before AI, of course. But without some genuine character relationships at their heart, they're dead in the water. Well, this week, three films that, regardless of their limitations, were at least made by human beings. 
Yo no quiero vivir 250 años más. ¿Por qué no? Porque me trataron de ladrón. El Conde is a lunatic concoction that suggests Chilean dictator Pinochet was in fact a 250-year-old vampire. More horror, this time about Indian-American teenagers fighting monsters while trying to fit in at high school. It lives inside. Tamira, what's going on with you? All the stories we heard growing up, they're all true. It lives inside. But first, one of the oldest and most enduring storylines provides the title for a cheesy rom-com on Netflix this week, Love at First Sight. I lost his number, but I need to find this guy that I met on the plane. Sounds really stupid. Sounds brave. With miles and miles between them, there is only a 0.2% chance that they will ever see each other again. Love at First Sight, like Snakes on a Plane and Ruby Gilman Teenage Kraken, is one of those films in which the entire storyline is mapped out in a four-word title. It also describes the appeal of its star, Hayley Lou Richardson, when I first saw her in a comedy drama called Support the Girls with Regina Hall. It makes such a difference when your boss really cares about you. The sisterhood growing stronger. Sisterhood! Woo! Ah, ah. Ah, you're the best and we love you! Sweet, upbeat, vulnerable, a bit dim maybe. Haley Lou was that out of fashion thing these days, the all American girl next door. She later took those attributes to the highly successful TV series, The White Lotus. Love at First Sight clearly aspires to that show's sophistication with its slightly gimmicky narration. On a typical day at John F. Kennedy Airport, there are thousands of people going hundreds of places. Excuse me, sorry. My battery keeps dying. I'll borrow mine if you want. But today, a girl and a boy will meet. Hayley Lou Richardson plays American Hadley, while Ben Hardy is English Oliver. Ben's best known for playing Queen drummer Roger Taylor in Bohemian Rhapsody. The narrator, she also plays an assortment of bit parts, is Jamila Jamil from another smart TV series, The Good Place. Sorry, I don't uh, share electronics till the third date. OK. No, I suppose it is quite intimate. And it will change everything. So, lots of good pedigree, and Love at First Sight starts out with a certain amount of promise. I mean, if the girl meets the boy in the first minute or so, it must be going somewhere unexpected after that, right? And while we wait, we can't deny it's nice to see these two being effortlessly charming. Over the next six hours and 47 minutes, Hadley Sullivan and Oliver Jones will fall in love. This is me. Well, this is unexpected. <laughs> Hadley's father has already fallen in love at first sight, if not in a good way. While working in England, he fell for a colleague, divorced Hadley's mum, and is now about to get married again. So why is Oliver going back home, she wonders. If claustrophobia is one of your biggest fears, then why are you about to embark on a seven-hour flight? That is a very good question. A wedding. Same as you. Right. That is actually my loungewear. Well, keep on wondering, or there'll be no plot at all in Love at First Sight, rather than the bare minimum there currently is, because there seems to be nothing to get in the way of their instant attraction, you'd think. Do you want to join me at the cinema? Make our first date dinner and a nice cheesy rom-com? Down for a cheesy rom-com. As long as there's a happy ending. And the writer-director team, their names predictably are Katie, Jennifer and Vanessa, belatedly realise they need to throw in a few hurdles. What could go wrong at Heathrow Airport, for instance? Well, Hadley loses Oliver's details at the very moment that Oliver gets into trouble with airport security and they both dash off in opposite directions. The odds of finding your soulmate are slim to none. This is my number. Text me so I've got yours. Oh, no. The odds of finding them again. Good luck. But don't worry if you were worrying. The odds, as narrator Jamila keeps telling us and Oliver keeps backing it up, may be against this cheesy rom com reaching its happy ending. But it would take a heart far harder than those of Katie, Jennifer, and Vanessa to shatter the dreams of anyone played by Hayley Lou Richardson. You like a 
tech bro or? I'm studying statistics at Yale. Subtle status drop there. <laughs> British, you know, I can't help myself. <laughs> I'm falling for you. The target audience for something called Love at First Sight would probably be perfectly happy watching these two flirting for the entire movie. But even they have to admit that some complications are needed for the story to reach a conclusion. Are we going to talk about her? She could be anywhere, but I can't stop thinking about her. You won't find her just sitting here. Is everything all right? I have to go. Well, this is where parents are so helpful. Come in, Oliver's adorably ailing mum, played with a stiff upper lip by the always useful Sally Phillips. Meanwhile, the slightly less fortunate Hadley is given a father played by the eternally wooden Rob Delaney. I didn't see this coming. Love is a lot of work. It makes no sense. It's not supposed to. Is it better to have had a good thing and lost it or never to have had it? If I've given the impression that Love at First Sight is a brilliantly unpredictable gem, weaving a magical tale full of surprises and delights, then I'm sorry I've misled you. It's none of these things, though in the hands of a better, less sentimental filmmaker, it could have been a bit like that, perhaps. Um, what's your favourite colour? Food? Animal? <laughs> Seriously? Come on. Yellow Mexican dogs, you. But Hayley Lou Richardson makes up for a multitude of sins and she and Ben Hardy make a couple it's impossible to be unkind about. It's on Netflix and it's the perfect sort of film to watch if you're in bed with a bad cold. Mind you, the odds against me liking it if I hadn't already been softened up by Hayley Lou a few years ago are probably astronomical. Blue, curry and birds. Birds? Ew. What do you mean, who? The symbol of freedom. <laughs> they shit everywhere. So do dogs. El Conde is a reminder of the one advantage fiction has over non-fiction. The endings are so much better. In real life, the worst villains often lead long, happy lives, revelling in their ill-gotten gains. Only in fiction can a monster like Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet get anything like his just desserts. <laughs> Well, that seems to be the rationale behind a film by Chilean director Pablo Lorraine. Since the justice system failed so abjectly, Pinochet died before he could be charged with thousands of murders and millions of stolen dollars, El Conde could at least trash his memory. El Conde means the Count, and the premise of the movie is that Pinochet is in fact a 250-year-old equivalent of another criminal aristocrat, Count Dracula. That's right, he's a vampire. Not just a vampire, but one who's faked his own death and could easily live another 250 years. A un soldado se le puede decir que es un asesino, pero no que es un ladrón. Pero robaste, o no. In this, he's assisted by his equally corrupt wife, Lucia. El Conde suggests she was even worse than Pinochet, and a sinister Russian butler who's been rewarded for his service by being made a vampire too. Mrs. Pinochet is forced to remain mortal for some reason. Estuve estudiando su caso judicial. Dice que usted ordenó el asesinato y la desaparición de miles de chilenos. Yo. También hay dinero mal habido. Mis hijos no saben trabajar y yo no quiero que se mueran de hambre. Claro. Pero no vaya a pensar que yo soy un ladrón. No, no, no. no. Now, you'll have to get used to that expression for some reason. El Conde is a bleakly comic fable with a plotline that has very little connection to logic. At the start, Pinochet decides he's sick of living. He summons his family, presumably to dish out some of those ill-gotten gains. Yo vine para acá porque dijeron que iban a repartir plata. Eso te lo dije yo para convencerte, imbécil. ¿Y entonces no van a repartir nada? But it seems he's more concerned about his legacy. He doesn't mind being reviled as a mass murderer, but it's embarrassing to be called a mere thief. It was all, he says, an accounting mistake. 
Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes, señor. También es verdad que yo he cometido errores. Errores de contabilidad. Which is why they brought in an attractive young accountant to tidy up his affairs. What the family doesn't realise is that Carmen Cheetah is in fact a Catholic nun charged by the church to exorcise any devils in the Pinochet household. Papá, esta es la contadora que nos va a ayudar. ¿Es de confianza? Totalmente familia militar. Pablo Lorraine's previous films were mostly fact-based drama rather than fictionalised allegory. He made Spencer, about Princess Diana, Jackie, about Jackie Onassis, and a smart docudrama called No, about the actual downfall of Pinochet. But El Conde is downright peculiar, not least in its choice of narrator. Senator Pinochet was a staunch friend of Britain throughout the Falklands War. His reward from this government was to be held prisoner for 16 months. It's told by Margaret Thatcher in English, offering new and extremely unlikely reasons why she was always such a keen supporter of Pinochet. But at least she remains consistent in the film, unlike nun exorcist accountant Carmen Cheetah. Estoy muy enamorado de una joven contadora francesa. Existen las criaturas del diablo que no tienen alma, y yo se la voy a salvar. One minute she's polishing the silver hammers, stakes and holy water. Next, she's taking signs with Pinochet against his family. Meanwhile, Pinochet, smitten by the lovely Carmen Cheetah, decides he does want to stick around now and takes regular blood-sucking trips to town. A vampire has to live, after all. <laughs> El ejército de Chile me enseñó como un valor el acto de la tortura. ¿Alguien se metió en su maleta? Trajo estacas y martillos de plata. El Conde actually picked up a Best Script Award at the recent Venice Film Festival, possibly for good intentions rather than actual achievement. Unlike Carmen Cheetah, I found the Count's appeal rather elusive. But possibly it worked better with a Chilean audience. After 17 years of the real Pinochet, they probably needed a laugh. Si nos matamos nosotros. Vos vais a matar a cuatro vampiros. Horror films aren't generally an acquired taste. You either love them or you don't. I'm a bit half and half. The ones I like are generally rooted in some sort of reality. Jaws, Alien, even Invasion of the Body Snatchers, rather than supernatural hocus-pocus. But at least It Lives Inside draws on some less familiar hocus-pocus. Not dollops of the Book of Revelations this time, or that old standby, the ancient Native American burial ground. It lives inside's inspiration, comes from old Indian folk tales. Sam's family are immigrants, but she's more concerned with fitting in at her all-American high school. Mum worries, is she losing her Asian identity? When Tamir and I were kids... My mom used to tell us stories. Meanwhile, another Indian-American teenager, Tamira, is having the opposite problem. She can't shake off her Indian roots. She freaks out her classmates because she wanders around the school clutching a mysterious black jar. Her teachers are worried about her too. What is the deal with Tamira? Is she doing all right? My stomach drops every time she, like, appears out of thin air like that. Finally, Sam asks Tamira, and Tamira tells her. It is, in fact, a haunted mysterious black jar. Remember those scary stories we used to be told as children? Well, like that. Sam asks Mum for more information about jars and darkness, and Mum obliges. In fact, Mum's got two jobs in this film, providing exposition and banquets for big family gatherings. I said never to sleep with a bad feeling in our hearts because there's a dark thing that feeds on those feelings. 
Sam poo-poos all this immigrant mumbo-jumbo. After all, she's a modern, all-American kid now, more interested in boyfriends and homework than the old ways. But in horror films like It Lives Inside, old ways have a habit of catching up with you, whether you like it or not. It needs to tenderize the soul by attacking your sanity, isolating you from those who love you. And if anyone tries to help you, it will hurt them. Why are you whispering? It's listening. The film is the debut feature of writer-director Bishal Dutta and has been received favourably in horror fan circles. It has to be said that Dutta is quite effective at setting moods, lots of dark red-lit rooms and spooky black shapes. But he's less effective at making much sense of it all. There's something in here. You can't see it. But it, it lives inside. Generally, horror films are most effective when they keep it simple. The more explanation required, the more inconvenient questions start being asked by the audience. It's coming to get you, look out, is fine, rather than it's out to get some of you, sometimes, and sometimes you can get away and sometimes you can't. It's called the pishash. It doesn't kill you right away. It eats you slowly. So how powerful is the dreaded pishash when it finally starts appearing? And what does it take to make it stop? I suppose that's true of all horror films. We want it to be terrifying, but we also want our heroine to walk away at the end, more or less in one piece. What do we do? We must make an offering. Boom. Only you, Shanti. Only you, the producers of It Lives Inside are best known for their work with writer-director Jordan Peele, whose Twilight Zone-type know-how is the missing ingredient here. Though, to be fair, I can hardly complain when a film not aimed at me turns out not to be to my taste. When it's ready... It eats your soul. And it could be worse, of course. It could have been a teenage kraken after all. Though I suspect that's what AI might have dreamed up. Let's leave that for the sequel. I'm Simon Morris and I hope you'll join me at the movies same time next week.